Hi, I'm Lars. Welcome back to my shop. Um, not really a shop, it's more like my office. But uh, today we're talking about lantern frames. All right. I've had a couple people ask me about, you know, my techniques that I've been using. Put a video out. Of course, everyone, you know, hey, everybody does stuff different. So let's, you know, figure out how you guys do this thing. I said, okay, cool. So I am putting together a video on how I actually get JPEGs converted to DX, DXFs. Um, I don't use a lot of SVGs. I mean, I do use SVGs um, for other things like sublimation and whatnot. But uh, usually if I find a picture, it's a JPEG, you can pretty much bring them in, especially if they're like stencils and stuff like that. You can bring them in directly into convertio.co and convert it to a, a SVG or, or a DXF. And I'm gonna show you guys how to do that. But this is what we're talking about. Okay, these are the faces. This this was a stencil, uh, a Christmas stencil that was found online and just made into a face for a lantern, all right? Um, this is a test phase. Now, if you're building anything on a CNC, before you do this phase, make sure you do this phase. You may do two or three of these because you're gonna set them up, you're gonna, for like the lantern, you're gonna set them together, you're gonna try to figure out, you're like, this is the side of a lantern. Um, does this look good? Is it too close? If your lanterns have a bottom to them, okay? Notice that this is not gonna fit because it's gonna be right up against the bottom. So this is why we raised it for the next one, all right? Because some lanterns have bottoms on them. All right, so something else that I thought of, which I haven't seen, but I'd like, uh, I'm gonna share this with everybody. Um, you know, we do all these holiday things like this for Halloween, for Christmas and whatnot, but no one has done anything like this. I haven't seen it. So um, this is just a, a prototype, but something you can set on your desk with one of the faces, okay? So here's the, you know, here's the, the stocking. Right? You can put something behind it if you wanted to. You can put some fairy lights behind it, or you can put a tea lamp light behind it, or something like that. You know, bring it into your office at work. Someone might like it. I don't know. But we're going to start producing these. Um, today, we're going to make this. All right. Obviously, I've already made it. So I'm going to show you how I made it. All right. So let's first get into. Uh, getting a, a JPEG, which I've already got the JPEG, I got the JPEG for this. I'm going to show you how to convert it to a, a DXF and bring it into Carveco. Now, um, the DXF, you can go into Carveco, you can go to Fusion 360, VCarve, anything you really want. doesn't really matter. But the key is getting that JPEG to a DXF. All right, so let's go see how this works. First part of this is going up and doing a conversion of a JPEG. So how did I get the JPEG? I did a search out for Christmas stencils and found, you know, various kind of uh, images that I like. Like this one here with the bells on it is this guy right here. So it was a JPEG. I brought it in, made it a DXF. And the way that I made it a DXF is first I downloaded it. So here's a snowman head I've already downloaded. And here is convert IO. I don't know if it's convert Shio or convert IO or whatever. Um, but notice there is no C O M. It's a C O at the end. So all you do is you drag that JPEG over to the website and you drop it and it'll come up and say ready. And then there's a little drop down box here. So you need to go to CAD DXF and you can add as many files as you want. Uh, it will only convert two at a time, but once those two are done, it'll convert the next two and the next two and the next two, unless you buy an account. So here you can hit uh, convert. It'll upload the file. It'll do your conversion, and then you'll get a little download button here. Click the download. It'll ask you where you want to put it. You can name it whatever you want. And then it's a DXF, so you hit save. 
You can see this is downloading right here. And I don't know what's up with Windows 11, but sometimes you have to hit F5 to get it to refresh. So now you get your DXF file. It's just a normal DXS file. If you've never opened one up, I'm going to open this up and show it to you all. Um, it just has a bunch of different, you know, coordinates in it, polylines, information, where they're going to and whatnot. Um, the next thing is we're going to have to bring it over into Carvco. So head over to there and do that. In order to bring this into Carveco, what you need to do is start with creating a new model. Now, again, this could be done in anything, not Carveco. It could be done in Fusion 360, but I did it in Carveco, so we're going to use Carveco. Um, so when you grab a new model, you can hit width of 5.5 for the picket width, because that's how wide the so wide the lanterns are. They're five and a half inches wide. So they're five and a half inches wide and they're seven inches tall. Now, I use these dimensions as my material dimensions, not my work area. All right. The, so I'm not going to create, I'm not going to create a work area. Say this is four inches by three inches and figure out how to put that on my piece of wood. It's easier, in my opinion, it's easier to take off the point of where the corner is and then know how far over this is going to be. This way, um, if I had a whole bunch of wood sitting out to the side, right, I can put this in, cut it off, bring it over, you know, and then have these all laying side by side. It's, it's just the way that I was trained um, many years of being brainwashed, I guess. But I always use the bottom left corner. So we have the width of 5.5, the height is 7, the... Uh, inches we're using resolution doesn't matter and I always use the bottom left corner um, if I start making bowls or something like that I may change to the center uh, depends on if I'm doing uh, split wood like you know oak walnut oak and I want you know they're all different sizes and stuff the center makes sense all right so let's click OK move to the 3d the, the 2d window we're going to go to vector we're going to do an import we're sitting here on the demo. Here's a DXF file that we just created. We create, click OK. All this stuff here is 222 inches, 369 inches. Don't worry about any of that. Okay, it says automatically rejoin vectors, uh, file units as inches. First thing that happens is when you click OK, it resizes it to the size of your model. Um, this little uh, tool window is a little messed up, in my opinion. Um, but we'll get to that in a second. So what you're looking at here is you're looking at the the carve that's going to come up. It's This would blow out the top, and this would blow out the bottom. So we need to change the dimensions. I usually work on the width as 3.5. And then you can click Apply, and then this here would be smaller. If you were to make this 4.0, okay, and hit Enter, that will hit the Apply button. And, but this is still a little close to me. Notice at this point in time that your apply button disappeared. The reason it disappeared, you can hit this at 3.5 again. Um, I don't know why it disappears, but if you hit your enter button, it'll work. Or if you click off someplace else and back in the apply button and scale in inches and all that will come back to life. Um, just little tweaks of learning how to work with Carco. So the next part of this is to create a toolpath. So first thing you need to do is select everything, then click on toolpath, and then click on this little uh, area clearance icon. Uh, so if you go down to material thickness, you can either go to setup here or you can go to toolpath material setup. Um, apparently Carveco keeps the last thickness that you had, or at least the model position, the top offset. I don't know why, but it, it does. So we just hit OK. And then, so that hit that material setup. If I hit setup here again, it's going to do it now. It's going to actually put this in here. So I would recommend hitting this setup. Otherwise, this toolpath material setup changes here will not be applied. Keep that in mind. So use this setup. 
Uh, the finish step is going to be 0.6 because we're cutting completely through. Uh, we're going to add a two end mills. One's going to be a quarter inch. Uh, if you haven't done this in, in CarveCo yet, please go in and set up your tool numbers to match. Just hit edit and have these match what you have in your massive machine. It'll make your life a lot easier. Otherwise, you'll keep on saying tool one, tool one. You can only add one at a time here. You can't select you know, two of these and have them both come down. So whatever one you're selecting, you can hit select. And you gotta go back in and add for the second one for the, for the eighth inch. Um, let me move this up here. Uh, so that gets everything set up. You want to make sure you add your ramping moves in. Uh, this is, I know you're cutting into cedar. There's a couple things that this does. One, you're not just boring down into the material, into your wood. You're just not just boring into it and then taking off and cutting. Um, that could snap a bit. In cedar, probably not. But it also makes a cleaner cut because it goes down really slow and gets down into the material instead of just plopping in and taking off. Uh, once it gets down to the bottom, you have a little bit of a cut and then it will continue to go. And you, then you'll start cutting your material, which is what you want. You want to be a nice smooth transition. So the next part of this is naming your tool path. So 1-4 and 1-8 area. And I know um, the reason I do this is because I want to make sure that I know from looking out here in the tool pass, what I'm looking at. Because if I, well, I'll probably hope I spelled that right. Um, if I had a bunch of these listed here, I'd have to go into each one to find out what my tool bits are. So I, na I name these for one quarter and one eighth just to know that, hey, this is my one quarter and one eighth. Okay, now that you have all your tool pass created and you want to see your simulation, there's a little button here, a little icon, simulate tool path. You can click on that. It'll kick over to the 3D view. You can kind of move this around holding your uh, mouse wheel down. And that's what we want. Next part of this is to save this off. Uh, this is where things get a little different with me. Um, I will not put these into one file. Uh, they, to me, they, the way the beginning and end of the decode is kind of drives me a little crazy. So I'm going to split this out and I'm going to take and save this off as step one, one quarter area clearance. And that'll get saved. And I'll move this off of here, bring the other one back, and I will make this step two area clearance. Now, that's all we're going to do in Carveco. And then there's one more step that I do before I take it out to the shop. So let me save this guy off. Snow in head. So now that we have everything exported from CarveCo and saved off, here's the two NC files. Step one, quarter inch, step two, eighth inch. I take these to the next step. Now, there's a reason for that. I don't use the center, as I stated in CarveCo, I don't use the center as an origin point. I use the bottom left front corner, all right? In doing so, um, I used to do tool and die a long time ago, um, CNC operator and tool and die um, operator also. Uh, one of the things you never did is you never started a bit outside of what was called the clamp wall. Okay, so you, if you started it out here, um, pretty much you were going to get you know your butt handed to you by your supervisor or owner, which was my uncle. So you always started a bit in the middle. Um, got it spinning, and then you actually went and did your tooling, and before you left the clamp wall, that spindle needed to be stopped spinning, and you could, you could take it out. Um, being that we were not messing with wood, you're messing with a piece of steel, you're not gonna take a piece of steel and put it in and say, oh, well, this is a five and a half by seven inch piece of wood that I need, so let's just make this, you know, nine inches wide and, you know, 10 inches long. Put this in the center like I want, and then I'll do all my carving, and then when I'm done, I'll just come and I'll cut this off. You just don't do that with a piece of metal. Um, so that's the way that I was trained, and that's the way that we do that here. All right, so that's the reason I do this. So with the CarveCo Fusion whatever, 
you know, if it's going to come in and you're going to pick the center, there's no problem to leave it like that if you want to do it like that. If you want to pick this corner or this corner or that one or this one, uh, I suggest changing your code a little bit. And that's what my application does. All right. This is not an ad for an application, by the way. Um, so if we run the, the code, my application is what it looks like. It's just a console app, nothing major. We're going to fix start and end file with the directory. So it will go into this directory, find all the NC files, and then it creates this Lars workshop. Now, I usually put in the name here, and I leave the version number that got created. Um, so what is actually does this do? If we go to win merge, Browse, takes a minute to browse. Compare. Win Merge is a free program. It just allows you to compare two files so you can check all the differences. This will tell you all the differences that are there because um, this is the original file. Um, here, this is the change that I wrote. So basically, it just reads everything out of the file until it finds certain parts or replaces them. All right. So my I have comments in mind to say move to work origin code added to avoid clamps. So the first thing that I do is we leave, come down to this M8. I'm actually looking for the M06 and then seeing, you know, we go from there. So I put the M08 in. Um, the original code at this point in time, M08 starts up your coolant, the, then it starts up your spindle, and then it moves it on a G00, which is... The G00 says move as fast as possible for the machine to move in this direction to this point, no matter how fat, how I need to get there. So since there's an X, a Y, and a Z in this, it's going to come from wherever it's at, and it's going to go at an angle, no matter how it needs to get there. It doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. It's just going to be a straight line from the point you're at to where it's at, breaking all X, Y, and Z planes. After that, the real work starts working. So this is really the big thing that kind of drives me nuts um, because of my, my history in CNC. So the first thing I do is I bring this to Z 2.0, right? So no matter where it's at, if it's up here, it's down here, it's going to come down to two inches or up to two inches off the, off the, off the piece of wood. Then at that point in time, it's going to move to the work origin. After it moves to the work origin, then we're going to move to the X and Y location, just staying in that level at the Z2 inches off the board to the 2.5 and 1.7. That will clear any clamp that I have. Okay, we're two inches off the board. If I've got clamps that are two inches thick, I've got a serious problem. Um, so just to say. Uh, at that point in time, we're going to drop down a 0.2, just like we did. they're doing here, but we're doing it in a different order. It's sort of like homing your machine. Your machine. You're going to home Z, and then X and Y could happen together, or you could do X or Y, but all three of them being done at the same time is usually not a good idea. Um, now, if you're cutting, you know, whatever, that's fine. I'm just saying if you're just moving the, the spindle or router around. At that point in time, I'm 0.2, off the, 0.2 inches off the top of the material, and I feel it's safe because I'm within the realm of the clamp wall to start that spindle up now. So this spindle is going to start at 15,000 RPM. I want that thing as far away from my clamps and my fingers. I don't want it to cross my clamps. I don't want it to be anywhere near my fingers. All right. Uh, there's a G4 uh which says pause this thing for two seconds and then the program starts so that's all this program does right on the beginning side of it on the ending side of it uh the original code just goes to point two and then it shoots out to x y this is adding the homing code in which has already been hard coded so i don't know why we need to do that um, and then it turns off the spindle turns off the coolant and stops so this thing is still moving at point two which would for my case, cut right through my clamp, all right? So I don't want to do that. So what I do is I bring it to point two. This is the end of the carve code code. And then I turn off my spindle. Then I turn off my coolant. 
I bring it up to two inches and then I move it over to my X0, Y0, and then I end my application. That's all this does. Now again, this is all because of my training in, C, in C's and in, in the machine trades. Um, I just feel it's safer. I just don't want my, you know, I want to keep my digits and everything. Not saying that you're going to lose your digits. I'm just, you know, it's just, there is that possibility. So I'm just kind of moving on down the road. All right. So now the other reason here, when I move this guy down into snowman head, right? Onto my F drive, I've got a list of all my Lars workshop stuff, my bells, my candy cane, Christmas tree, whatever. And I have the dates that they were there. So I know that these dates that are on these things are the ones that I have. So if you were to take, you know, the bells here, and I could now write on these someplace, I could take a pencil, you know, put it on the back, and I could put 2023-1117.1, like that, right? 2023-1117.1. And that matches up to these bells right here. So I know that this was the last thing that I cut, and that's the code for it. All right. So that's just a test print anyway. All right. So with all this in mind, I got the stuff on my handy dandy little jump drive. And I'm going to take this out to the to the shop and we'll get these this gut and we can see how this video is going to go over about how do we actually do the faces on the lanterns. I've had a couple people ask that question um, and we do them on the CNC so this is just going to be something for all the CNCers out there can see what I do and how it's done. Um, normally these are a lot longer. Um, I've got a couple that are sitting out there but basically they're six foot long and you can hang something off the back of this uh, back of my spoil board uh, about two feet. So what I do is we set this down, run it all the way back, and we cut out a face on the front part, portion of this. Then I go out and measure up the seven inches, and then we cut that off and then cut the, all the sides off of that. Uh, this is just a piece of scrap that we have. Um, we'll get another face off of this one. But basically we lay it down. I've got a board that I made. It's just a piece of birch. It's not Baltic birch. It's a cheap birch you find over it. Home Depot, it's just a strap that was laying around. And I strapped down the top of it, you know, like this. So I just strapped that down across the top, and that holds the top pretty flat. And then we bring this down close enough to the front so I can put my little clamps that I made on here and clamp down that. And that's all we do to, stra to strap them down. Um, I'll get this here hooked up and get it ready for probing and show you where we go from there. Okay, so at this point what I'm doing is I'm putting on my my quarter inch bit. Um, all of the the faces that we do for the lanterns they run with a quarter inch bit first and then they for area of clearance and then they run again for the 1 8 inch bit after that. So first bits quarter inch, second bits eighth inch you can go down to a 16th, you can go down to a 32nd, you can go down as far as you want. Um, I'm not a huge fan of going down that low. It just adds more time to the, to, the, uh, to the cut and it really doesn't improve the way it looks. All right, just to let you know. But when you run down to a 16th inch, you're gonna add like 10 more minutes to the cut. It's not really worth it because people are not looking at it going, oh wow, look at this, look at all the detail in this. If it was something like that, yeah, but for for lanterns, there's something to sit up on your porch, sit up on your fireplace or wherever, and a lot of people are going to look at it. Um, something I do, for those of you that don't do CNC, is I usually put the bigger wrench in my left hand, the smaller in my, in my right, so when I go to tighten something, I can pull it toward me to tighten and go the other way to loosen up. It's just a habit I developed when I was working uh, at my uncle's shop. Okay, second thing, here's the, uh, the probing. Um, let me get this here probed up. And to do that, we just need to make sure your magnet's on. I'm gonna run the Y back over. 
free it up a little bit, and then hit that. Oops. One mistake I just made. Um, proving save. Hit it. So when you're doing probing, and we're going to have a bit change when we go to the second program, um, it will. Um, you're not. I'm not going to reprobe my X and Y. I will reprobe my Z for the height, and then at that point, you'll see me lay this under on down like this and touch off on it with the with the smaller bit, which is in this column. So the first thing we're going to do is load up one of the files for the lantern face. Uh, this is Snowman Scarf. This, I always label my things with step one and then the bit and then what exactly am I doing with it. Uh, it makes things easier for later. I also have a little program that creates, uh, takes my G code that I export from Carveco and cleans it up a lot. And you're going to see a lot of that happen on the spindle here. So I always put uh, Lars Workshop, the, the, file, the directory Snowman Scarf and then the date that it was done. So this was just created on 11.17 and .1 is the version of it. So I know what what version I always carry on my on my uh, jump drive or flash drive, whatever you want to call them. So we're going to load up the one, one quarter clearance. It'll load the screen. And then we're going to go back to program MDI. Now, my origin, you're going to see this here pop up and it's going to pop up to about here. So there's my work origin. Same as everybody else. We're just going to come over here, hit rewind, then we're going to hit cycle start. It'll tell me load the 4 1 quarter inch EM, which that comes from the T4M06. So we came down to there. You'll see a lot of stuff in this code here. I'll zoom in on it. In the G code that says. Uh, move to work origin code added to avoid clamps um, Everywhere that's in there. That's what my program does. It goes in and it adjusts all this stuff um, I don't like bringing my bits in hot Okay, so this is what you're going to see which you'll see this is a little bit different if you guys do Carveco Not saying that they're not doing something wrong. This is just for me and my past experience of being in tool and die <laughs> So my bit will go out to where it needs to go, and then it will turn on, right? Then it waits, because Maso waits, but I also have a GO4 in there to wait for two seconds. And then it starts cutting. And before it gets too loud, um, I do put ramping moves in, I do put bridges in, and this is a, these are just ramping moves right now. You're seeing it going down, and then it'll, it'll take off. So I'm going to try to get the camera and the screen so you can see the X is moving around over here.
Now I hope you saw that. At the very end, my bit comes up, stops, comes up to point two, stops. Then it comes up to two inches, and then it moves out. Um, if it would have come up to two inches and came out here to the origin, it would have cut right through my clamp. So that's why I put my coat in. All right, we're going to load the next file. It's a 1 8 inch bit. So that means this guy's got to come off. This guy's got to get tapped out, get all the the dust out of it, put in the eighth inch bit. I find holding these bits with my pinky, just to hold them in there to get the, the nut started, I spin my, I turn my spindle, and then I turn the nut, and then I spin it to make sure that it's straight. Um, and once I make sure it's straight, lock them up. Get the bit out of the way. Put this flat, go back to jogging and probing. Bring my bit so it's above. Let's get the bit above the probe, put the magnet on, very important, then hit the button. When that's done, that's all I need to do. Now, like I said, you don't go back and don't do the XY again. This guy's got a bunch of little things that's going to go in and hit out. Back to program MDI. I'll go back to my work origin. Some of the sawdust. Hit rewind. Hit start. Tells me, hey, you want to change the number three bit? Yep. And then go. And again, you'll see this will lower down into it before it turns on. Now, my spindle's making a little bit of noise. Um, that's not because it's going bad. That's not because this is water cooled or anything. There's some grease that just needs to get pushed around. If I let it go, I'm gonna have to bring it out here and just let it spin for a while without any bit in it. And uh, eventually that will go away. And again, thanks to Clinton at PWN CNC for that information. And I have a, another video I'm still trying to finish up about it when he gave me that information. But it's, it's due to it being cold. I don't know if you can see this. I want to put my cell phone here. When the 1 8 inch bit is running, you can see how this, this, this phone is going to rock back and forth. So stabilizers on your table are very important. They're the 45 degree angles that I put on the corners of all my tables. But this thing, when it's doing these real tiny little shakes, you'll see the phone will just start shaking.
watch the bit. It'll go up, stops, freezes, and gets out of your clamps. That's one thing that I suggest to anyone that's new to CNC. Learn how to edit your G-code and <clears throat> make sure you're going to do that because otherwise, like I said, this clamp that I have right now would be pretty much gone. So, all right. So now, what did we end up with? Let's take this back to uh, work origin and get this out of the way. And unbolt this. There is the snowman. Hopefully you can see him. There you go. Um, little things that I've learned along the way is make sure that your pieces of wood that are splitting between two area clearances or cutouts, whatever you want to call them, um, is not real, real thin. Now, this is about, it's a little more than an eighth of an inch here. You'll be okay with that. Um, just make sure, you know, you're boring this thing out as much as you can. Um, with a bigger bit. Uh, you don't need to slow anything down. It'll it'll take it um, Make sure little things like your the nose here With the nose I had to open this up a little bit had to elongate it some more Because um, it was stopping all the way back here because the, the eighth inch bit couldn't get through so you had to open this up some Make sure when you're opening it up. You're not getting too close to another opening here like right here like the eyeball um, if you get too close to that, that'll blow out. Um, there was we, we made a reindeer one that had antlers. I had to remove some of the some of the antlers because they were just blowing out. Um, these are things that you just gotta you gotta realize when you're doing it. If you like the video, please click like. If you like this kind of stuff, um, please subscribe to the channel. Um, I really enjoy doing this kind of stuff for everybody. And the more subscribers that we get, the more you want to do it. Um, Hope everybody has a good day and uh, go see and see something.